Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whenever and wherever you're watching or listening. This is the Stochastic 2022-2023 NHL Betting Preview. I am your host, Michael Clifford, a.k.a. Slim Cliffy. And right there beside me is the guy that's been with me here for a few years now, uh, our single-entry DFS assassin, Mr. Joshua Harris. Josh, how you doing, buddy? I am going to mess up the stochastic Osimo name at least 465 times before October. But yeah, uh, I'm excited to be back. Uh, it's going to be a little bit more betting focus in the preseason, but we all bet on hockey. Like I know me and you do. Not everyone bets on hockey, but there's a lot of good bets out there. Uh, we're like a couple of days away from hearing about how everyone's in the best shape of their lives. <laughs> They're going to have career years and well, we already saw that. I think uh, we'll talk about him later, actually. But I think it was Kent Johnson from Columbus said between um, the World Juniors and which happened in the summer this this time because they were canceled at Christmas between the World Juniors and started the rookie camp, which is about three weeks. He put on seven pounds of muscle. Yeah. Um, so it's it's good to be young or it's good to uh, be geared up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like somebody said to be on that uh, Aaron Judge diet. Not saying that Aaron Judge is doing anything untoward. Uh, but yes, we are. We normally do talk about DFS here, but we are here to talk about betting uh, for the preseason. Not betting on preseason games, but betting on, um, you know, how teams will do uh, during the season. You know, whether it's a points threshold, win the division, win the conference, win the cup, um, you know, player props, you know, how many goals certain players will get to. So we're definitely going to talk about all that. But I just want to mention... Uh, it is a preseason. It's the first time we've done this, but we're hoping to have a few of these videos come out over the next few weeks leading up right to the NHL regular season. We're going to do a video on how to bet um, the NHL like all throughout the season. Um, it's different than just betting uh, on futures before the season starts. We're going to talk about um, how to play NHL DFS and how to use Fantasy Cruncher. Uh you know, an optimizer for uh, anybody playing DFS. So there are going to be a lot of videos uh, that we have coming out over the next few weeks. Please uh, come and check them out. Please like and subscribe uh, whenever you do watch these. Those numbers really help us and help us keep uh, bringing these videos, uh, not just through the preseason, uh, but all through the regular season and into playoffs. It's hard to believe um that the regular season is right around the corner like these last few years have really crunched everything like it it, it it doesn't feel that long ago that um we were watching tampa and colorado play really uh enticing and interesting uh stanley cup final uh just want to finally mention we do have uh some dfs and betting packages both over at stochastic.com so whether you're interested in playing uh, DFS, uh, Daily Fantasy over on DraftKings or FanDuel or where have you, uh, or you're interested in betting, uh, we do have uh, packages uh, available over at stochastic.com for both. So uh, if you want to head over there, uh, things like that also uh, help us out. And we're going to have, we're going to talk about uh, Odd Shopper a little bit later uh, in the show, but getting to our betting preview, the first, you know, a, an odd shopper special uh, let's talk uh, later in the show, but getting to the betting preview. Uh, I think we should talk about odd shopper right off the top because oddshopper.com is a free tool we have um, for people that do do betting uh, in legal States. Uh, and you can compare prices for the same game for the same player prop, what have you. Um, obviously there's nothing up for NHL right now, but there's stuff there for NFL, for MLB, um, MBAs uh, are certainly around the corner coming up in the next month and you can shop for the best lines. And I know you and I do a fair amount of betting. You bet a lot on MMA as well. Um, I, I, I got to assume that odd shop is something that you find useful because, you know, shopping for the best lines can honestly mean the difference between uh, profit and loss on a given night. So, you know, are you familiar? You're familiar with odd shop or something you use, eh? Yeah, I use it every week when I write my MMA articles because I write down the bets that I like and then I'll go shopping for the best lines and I'll put that in the article. Um, generally speaking for MMA, it's been pretty crazy. It's FanDuel has been the best book for that, but that's why you use it because you don't normally think, oh, FanDuel, they're great at everything. They're, but so you go look, could be BetMGM, could be, you know, DraftKings, but that's why you use it because if you find a better line, 
like you said, it's going to make a big difference on your bottom line if you're winning. Obviously, you got to win, but that's a great tool to to help get you on the on the right track. Yeah, absolutely. Um, definitely helps uh, when you're betting through the season as well, which is something that we mentioned er- er at the top of the show. Um, we're going to talk about how to bet NHL through the season on a future uh, video slash podcast, and we'll definitely be talking about Odd Shopper again then. All right, Josh, let's just jump right into it. Let's start talking about some of our favorite bets on the season. I made a little uh, spreadsheet uh, for some of my bets, and uh, I'm going to bring that up. And the first thing I'm going to do is is just bring up an example of of why shopping uh, for the best odds uh, can matter. Um, So this is, you know, don't mind the uh, Legend of Zelda background there. Uh, But this is uh, Toronto to win the East, the Toronto Maple Leafs to win the Eastern Conference outright. It's as low as plus 357 on Pinnacle. Now, this was as of uh, late um, Monday night, September 19th. So certainly things may have changed. But uh, they're as low as plus 357 on Pinnacle uh, and as high as plus 500 on FanDuel. So it's an extra dollar, fit, nearly an extra dollar 50 for every dollar bet um, if that hits, which is why um, shopping for lines uh, is so important. And those are the six, um, six sports books that I looked up. Uh, you can see them sports interaction pinnacle mgm DraftKings, FanDuel, and points bet um pinnacle isn't so great they don't have a lot for futures up there right now but that's where i do a lot of my betting through the season so it's just familiar for me uh bet 365 was another one that i saw that had uh, a lot to offer as far as player props uh player awards division winners that sort of thing so um lots of places where you can dig in let's dig into our first bet here I have the Carolina Hurricanes winning the East outright. Um, I know that they lost Vincent Trocek in the offseason, and that center position is kind of up in the air now, right? Um, Second line, third line center. You know, Jesperi Kakanyemi was brought in to eventually be that guy. I don't know if he's that guy just yet. Jordan Stahl is still a pretty good two-way center, so he can certainly do the job. Paul Stasny was brought in as a little bit of added insurance as well. now, they lost Max Pacioretty to injury. He probably won't be back until February, maybe. Um, but this is a team that has had, whose core has had numerous playoff runs, uh, including a conference final run a couple years ago. Um, this is a team that is very deep up front, that has a very good top four uh, on the blue line. Even if, you know, the newly acquired Brent Burns uh, coming in from San Jose uh, in the offseason – even if he's not the guy he was five or six years ago, he's still a pretty good puck mover, uh, specifically on the power play, which is what they're going to need, considering they lost uh, Tony D'Angelo. I also think Martin Natchez had a real tough year last year. Um, he's generally a pretty good playmaker, but that that didn't really come to the forefront. I think you see him rebound. And I think Seth Jarvis was arguably the best rookie in the NHL last year. It's just, you know, when you're on a cup contender, you're often playing third line minutes, maybe some fourth line minutes, you know, once in a while, jump to the top line or whatever. Um, But I, you know, there's some micro stats that show Seth Jarvis being an excellent, excellent rookie. Um, I think they have a lot of things going for them. Obviously the East is very tough, uh, but you know, if I can get greater than five to one, which you can get at a number of books like sports interaction um, or on DraftKings over on points bet, I like Carolina to win the East this year. What do you think? I do like Carolina. Um, but if they're going to win the East, they're going to have to beat my division pick, which is the Rangers. Now, you might want to call – you can call me a homer. You see the Rangers jersey hanging behind me. But you think about what they did last year, and they shouldn't have been there, right? They played over their head. They got excellent goaltending, and they got an excellent power play. Now, their power play is returning. A lot of people are saying, oh, you know, Igor can't repeat his season, but he's young and he might actually just be getting better. Now, they added Vincent Trocek, who's an upgrade over Ryan Strom. Um, you know, they get another season, you know, Alexis Lafreniere, Capo Caco, uh, Philip Hedel, they're a year older. You saw them take some strides in the playoffs. Now, that's not guaranteed they're going to it's going to translate, but you would assume with that confidence boost from playing well in the playoffs – that they're going to, you know, they're still being in the bottom six with sheltered roles advancing their game. So, you know, the Rangers at plus 350 to win the Metro, 
I think is pretty good odds. Uh, Carolina is the odds on favorite uh, on most books coming in around plus 225. So I think there is some value there on the Rangers winning the division on a team that overachieved last year, but only got better this year. Yeah. I, I And I honestly think um, your point about Philip Heedle is very important here. He looked like an absolute menace in the playoffs. Um, I don't just talk about his goal scored. He had a lot of good, really nice underlying stats, um, really good impact for the team. If he can be an anchor to a pretty good third line, I think that really changes the dynamic of this team compared to last year. Yeah, you know, they lost Ryan Strom and Frank Petrano, but he, like you said, they replaced him with Vincent Trocek. Lafreniere certainly looks like he's ready to take another step. But, you know, I, I'm kind of worried about that blue line. You know, you do have Fox, obviously. You have Truba. You have Keandre Miller, who looked very good. Ryan Lindgren, solid. Um, just where they've got, a you know, a couple, a few young guys back there. They just kind of have to carry their weight. Uh, but, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> My only note uh, when you said that you're betting the Rangers was, oh, yeah, here we go. <laughs> you know, like you said, you, when you got a Rangers jersey hanging behind you, it's kind of easy to make that inference. But, no, I like it. Uh, I don't mind uh, the Rangers at all. All right. We're going to stay in the Metropolitan Division, and we are going to wander on over to our next bets. Um, and there's uh, quite a few uh, that we have for the New Jersey Devils. Now, I don't want people to laugh when we say we're pretty high in the New Jersey Devils, but uh, one of the bets that you submitted was New Jersey to make the playoffs. And two of the bets I have listed is New Jersey to win the East outright uh, and New Jersey to clear their point total. Again, this is why shopping uh, for your odds is important. Um, you see uh, 88 and a half over on FanDuel and 90 and a half over on DraftKings with FanDuel giving you a, a better price. Um, and that, you know, we're going to probably say it a few times this show, but that's why shopping for your odds are so important. When it comes to New Jersey, like they added Andre Palat in the off season, which I think is a pretty big addition for them because they were kind of weak on the wing, you know, with Jesper Bratt really being only their only proven guy. You know, a, a Platt's not like a, a complete game breaker, but he's absolutely a top six, you know, top power play, reliable two-way guy. Uh, so I like that addition. You've got uh, a healthy um, Dougie Hamilton, uh, hopefully coming. He was injured uh, for quite a bit last year. Um, you've got, uh, I think, Alexander Holtz. Uh, he's going to be a rookie. I'm going to talk about him. Actually, I'll talk about him right now. He's one of my the bets that I have listed to win the Calder. Uh, depending where you go, you can get him You know, probably around 30 to 1, 33 to 1, something like that. Um, he tore up uh, the AHL last year. I think he had 26 goals in 52 games, averaging over three shots per game as a 19-year-old. Um, I think he goes right into the top six. And, of course, you have, you know, Jack Hughes had the breakout season last year. Jesper Brad had the breakout season last year. They have a decent blue line. You know, uh, Damon Severson, uh, he's still around. He had a really good year last year. Um, he's going to be an anchor along with Hamilton. Um, they added John Marino from Pittsburgh. I think that's a nice pickup for them. Uh, Jonas Siegenthaler is a good uh, defensive defenseman. Um, I, I really like all the skaters. What's worrisome is the goaltending. Um, I'm pretty sure they had the worst five on five goaltending in the NHL last year, but their goalies got injured. You know, uh, Blackwood got injured. Bernier got injured. They were running, you know, AHL e or ECHL goalies for months on end. Um, I think we see a big, big improvement there as well. Um, obviously, a pretty big long shot to win the Eastern Conference, but I really like the way New Jersey's looking, and clearly you do too if you have them making the playoffs. Yeah, it's a combination of a couple things. Just, you know, the Devils improving. You hope Blackwood or Samsonov, you know, can stay consistent, especially Blackwood if he stays healthy. But it's coupled with – there are some bad teams in this division. Like the <laughs> – the Flyers, which we'll get to, probably the worst team in the division, one of the worst teams in the AHL. Uh, I think the Devils are better than the Islanders. Listen, like Ilya Samsonov or um, Ilya Sorokin, the Islanders goalie, one of the best in the NHL. But like we saw last year, the Islanders just were just not great defensively. They had trouble scoring at times. I just think you know another full season of Jack Hughes with Jesper Bratt, like that's just one of the most dynamic duos in the NHL. Um, you got the Washington Capitals. Ovechkin's a year older. Um, they're kind of, you know, 
can they make the playoffs? Sure. But like, they just don't jump off the page as a team. You go, Oh yeah, this team's definitely making playoffs. You got the Columbus blue jackets who have some good young talent, but their blue line's still terrible. Pittsburgh penguins brought back the same core, but they're just old. Like if they fell off the wagon, I would not be surprised. And they lost Evan Rodriguez to the avalanche, which, you know, doesn't seem like a big deal, but he was a, a key player for them last year. So I, I just think, you know, it would not shock me to see the Devils finish third in this division or higher and make the playoffs. And on DraftKings right now, do your shopping. But at DraftKings, as we're recording, they're plus 140 to make the playoffs, the Devils. And I think that's some pretty good value. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think the Metro looks a little bit weak weaker than people might expect. I mean, it's just it was just a couple of years ago where it was, you know, the strongest division in hockey, probably. Um, I agree with you. You got aging Washington players. You got aging Pittsburgh players. Uh, you know, we'll get to Philadelphia in a second. They're going to be awful. I don't think Columbus is going to be very good um, either. Um, I think New Jersey can absolutely pick up some points against those bad teams. And it's like they don't even need elite goaltending to make the playoffs. They don't. They just need for their goaltending not to be last in the NHL uh, yeah. like it was last year. Um, let's stay in that division. Uh, you and I uh, had the same uh, idea here. Um, I'm going to bring it up on the screen share. The Philly point total, again, this is why shopping is important. You get anywhere from 72 and a half uh, to 77 and a half over on Sports Interaction. Um, I didn't see if you put over-unders uh, specifically. I got to assume <laughs> you're going under on the points here. Obviously, the news came out recently. Sean Couturier re-injured his back. That was a problem all of, well, most of last year. Doesn't look like he's going to be back anytime soon. They said Ryan Ellis is definitely going to be out for a while. Uh, Joel Farabee is not going to start the season with him. Um, they had a pretty bad blue line last year, um, and they added Tony D'Angelo. Like he's he's a good, very good puck mover and good on the power play, but he's you know he's awful defensively. That's not going to help them in that regard. So um, they were bad last year, and for them to surpass a seventy-seven and a half point total. They're going to have to add about seven or eight wins to what they did last year. And, you know, no Couturier, no Ellis. Fair be out for, you know, who knows how long. Hopefully not long, but it could be, you know, longer than we hope. A full season without Claude Giroux. Blue line, you know, after Ivan Provorov, they're anchored by Rasmus Ristolain and Nato D'Angelo. Um, yeah, I think we're both on, on board here with Flyers under, right? Yeah, and here's the thing with John Tortorella now coaching the Flyers, if you're not good defensively, you're going to be in his doghouse. Like Tony D'Angelo might be sent to Mars before Thanksgiving. <laughs> like instead of going after Johnny Gaudreau, they threw $5 million at Tony D'Angelo. He's not a John Tortorella player. So like that, there's going to be problems in that locker room. There's problems with the roster. You can say what you will about Carter Hart. Like, I think he's a good goalie, but like that blue line is just bad. And like, I feel bad for him, but do I though? Not really. But I, uh, yeah, do your shopping, find the highest total you can get and take the under. I mean, even at 72 and a half, the lowest shopping number we found, I'd still go the under there. But if you can get 77 and a half, that at minus 115, that's just, I, I don't ever want to say something's a lock, but that, that is, that is money. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely do some shopping. But like I said, even if you're only getting 72 or 73 and a half or whatever, they would still have to add five to six wins from they did what they did last year. I just don't see how that roster can add five to six wins unless Carter Hart has, you know, just an amazing season, which he can do. But you can say that about a lot of goalies, right? You say um, about any goalie, really. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Well, I don't know about any goalie. I'm thinking there's might be some goalies in Chicago that might have something to say about that. Um, we're going to move along to our next one. Uh, we're going to talk about another pretty bad team here, Arizona Coyotes, um, pretty much 65 and a half, wherever you go. Um, except I think on FanDuel, it's at 67 and a half. Um, it would just depend on the price on what the price you want uh, to get here. I was reading over the, on the athletic, uh, I believe it was yesterday they posted um, a season preview for the Arizona Coyotes, and they basically had them 50-50 to finish dead last in the league. Um, this isn't a very good team. Uh, we have to remember the wins that they did get last year. Like, they went on, like, an absolutely insane, like, six weeks shooting bender. Like, oh, yeah, mul not... like multiple guys shooting over 20% for a, for a long time. And that's where they picked up a bunch of wins. Um, 
they're not adding any substantial uh, prospects to the pool. Like there's a reasonable chance that Andrew Ladd, um, who was out of the league for like three years, ends up as a second line left wing. Like after Clayton Keller, you know, maybe Lawson Krause scores 20 goals. You know, Jacob Chikrin and Shane Gostisbehar might both get traded during the season. Um, like this is a t- like we saw the Colorado Avalanche six or seven years ago finish with like 48 points. It wouldn't surprise me if the Arizona Coyotes finished with like 51 points this year. What do you think? Yeah, this is one of the most awful teams. One of the worst rosters I've ever seen. Um, it's up there maybe with the what 2014 Sabres. <laughs> but yeah. like the funny thing is. I want them to be so good in the next few years because they're playing in that college stadium with like 2,000 people. So maybe Austin Matthews can go to Arizona, go home to Arizona, get some uh, – that environment there would be awesome if they're good. But, man, they are just a bad team. They have some good players. And, you know, they're obviously tanking. They have like 9 million draft picks coming up in the next few years. They've traded everyone for draft picks. They're going to be awful this year. There's just no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Yeah, I was looking earlier. In the next three years, they had 15 second and third round picks over the next three drafts. <laughs> they have like eight second rounders in the next three years or something like that. Um, they are definitely loading up for the future. Um, you know, maybe King Carl Vemelka again. Maybe the goalie stands on his head or something like that. But I'm not thinking uh, that Arizona is going to be very good. I, I guess – you know, maybe the Chicago. Maybe you know they beat up on Chicago and pick up a few extra wins. But I, I'm really not overly concerned about it. All right, let's get to one of yours next. Um, we mentioned him briefly uh, a little bit earlier. You have a Calder Trophy pick here, and is going to Columbus's Kent Johnson. Why don't you uh, try to sell me on Kent Johnson winning the Calder here? So, some of these longer odd bets. They're not odds on favorites to win, and I know that, but there's a couple reasons why I'm going to take some stabs. I have a few long odds bets here. One, we talked about at the top of the show, you put on a lot of muscle here. He's 12 to 1 currently on DraftKings. He's not the favorite. He's, I think, outside the top five favorite, but here's why I want to take the stab. One, there is a chance he does play with Patrick Lining and Johnny Gaudreau, and if he does, it's just going to benefit greatly. He's going to play, you know, 18 minutes a night. He's going to play on the top line, top power play, this and that. If he doesn't, then yeah, your bet is probably in trouble because after the top line, Columbus isn't great, but at 12 to one odds and the world junior performance he put on, and I'm going to take that stab that he does play with Johnny Gaudreau and Patrick Liney at times. Now here's the thing with these long odd bets, if he does and he starts having a really good season on these long odd future bets, most sports books will offer you cash out as, as the odds change. So let's say like he gets, he comes out of the gate with his hair on fire and he he's the first few months of the season. He's, Oh yeah. He's definitely in the, in the call to race and his odds drop from 12 to one to say three and a half to one. You're going to get a pretty good cash out option on your money here and then you can either decide is he gonna you know keep this up or you can take the funds out and reinvest it into another bet so on these long long future bets you know there's obviously question marks but there's high upside here with a chance to cash out early yeah um i i really like that that cash out idea um especially you know, we saw Lucas Raymond do that last year. Like, he had a really good first six weeks of the season. And then, you know, rookies tend to hit a wall. Like, I talked about Seth Jarvis in Carolina. I'm pretty sure he was a healthy scratch for a handful of games, right? Um, that You know, that can just happen with rookies. Um, I, you know, I was thinking about Kent Johnson. And if they have Boone Jenner, Jack Rozovic, and Cole Sillinger as their top three centers, you know, maybe we see Kent Johnson as a winger. Yeah. And maybe you see something like Rozovic, Johnson, and Line A. Um, as a line at some point and you know not that Patrick Line is great defensively but if Kent Johnson's feeding that guy pucks um, that's a pretty good way to rack up assists so I like it um, I'm going to mention a, call, a couple Calder bets I have as well um, I mentioned one earlier Alexander Holtz much longer odds um, he's 30 to 1 plus 3,000 um, on the only book that had him that I looked at like I said, he tore up the AHL last year. 
Um, he is a very, very good goal scorer. I mean, take the reports out of rookie camp for what they're worth. Um, but, you know, the reports were that he was, you know, pretty close to head and shoulders above almost everybody else on the ice. There is a top six spot for him, whether it's with Nico Hishier or with Jack Hughes. Um, Holtz could be in that top six and maybe eventually crack that top power play unit. It would not surprise me to see him have like a 25 goal season. Um, as a rookie, you know, maybe 20 to 25 goals. So um, I like Alexander Holtz at 30 to 1. And Lucas Reichel, we got to mention the Chicago Blackhawks. Um, Lucas Reichel was over a point per game player last year in the AHL as a 19 year old. I think he had like 59 points in 58 games or something like that. Um, he was another guy that apparently really stood out at rookie camps. And with the Chicago Blackhawks, basically getting rid of almost everyone that matters except for Taves and Kane. I think there's a chance he starts the season uh, on Patrick Kane's opposite wing. And there really isn't a lot of talent there. I could see him eventually making his way up to the top power play unit. Like I could see him have having one of those like 20 goal, 50, 55 point seasons on a pretty bad team just as uh, because of who he stuck with. Obviously it's a long shot over there at 50 to one. Um, don't expect him to win, but you know, if for some reason they don't trade Kane and Taves at the deadline, if he's playing with Patrick Kane for most of the season, you know, five on five hand power play, I don't mind taking a shot, uh, on, uh, Lucas Reichel at 50 to one. What do you think about Holtz and Reichel? Yeah, I like them as long shots and tying in DFS a little bit here. Like people do have to score on bad teams. So like if you get a good young player in a, Decent spot. It's kind of putting lipstick on a pig, but like, regardless, if you're going to play with Patty Kane, you're going to, you're going to put up points. Like just because the Hawks are not even going to sniff the playoffs doesn't mean Patty Kane can't have a good season. They're not mutually exclusive. So, you know, he's, he's going to have his points and, you know, if he's on his wing, he'll come along for the ride. Holtz is interesting too, because Devils have a ton of young talent. And if somehow he finds his way up with like Hughes at some point, like that kid can score. So yeah, 30 to one. I, I like both those bets. Yeah. Um, like I said, don't expect them to win. On, honestly, I think Matty Beneers probably ends up winning the Calder because I think he ends up the full-time second line center in Seattle. We're going to talk about Seattle in a little bit, but Beneers has much uh, shorter odds. But uh, if you're looking for a more of a favorite, I don't mind him as well. A little bit earlier, we mentioned Odd Shopper um, as a good way of shopping your odds. And if you're looking for more expert advice and picks on sports betting, or if you have more questions about upcoming matches and additional betting opportunities, be sure to sign up for our Odd Shopper Premium Insider Access. This new program combines elements of a picks offering with expanded access to our Odd Shopper hosts and experts. In addition to getting occasional insights and picks, you'll be able to interact directly with your favorite experts and engage actively with other community members. You'll be able to participate in our Odd Shopper and sports betting channels with the Stochastic Discord and also get access to premium insider channels where our insiders will directly communicate with our subscribers. We've listed some of the details of what you'll be getting through each insider on the site in the link below. And if you have any additional questions, feel free to drop us a line in Discord or email us at support at stochastic.com. Best of luck with your bets. And if you uh, just want to sign up right away, uh, like I said, click that link below or just go to stochastic.com. Uh, and in, the Premium Insider Access is currently live on the website. All right, Josh, uh, let's talk about some more bets uh, that you and I like. This one. I'm kind of worried about how Nashville is going to do this year. They, they are pretty much 96 and a half across the board. Um, you can get them at plus money as well. I have the under on 96 and a half point totals. Um, I can't bet on FanDuel, so I can't get that 97 and a half. But 96 and a half points is the under for me. Now, here's kind of my reasoning. Last year, they had 97 points, made the playoffs. They did that with Roman Yossi uh, putting up 96 points which I honestly still can't believe they got 43 goals and 43 assists uh, from Matt Duchesne. Uh, you got uh 22% shooting from Ryan Johansson. 
You got 1.2 points per game from Philip Forsberg, and you got a Vesna caliber performance from UC Saros. They got all that and managed 97. Now they're sitting at 96 and a half. Um, honestly, they need all their big guys to replicate what they did last year, which is something none of those players had ever done before. And I think that's really concerning for me. Now, they added Nino Niederreiter, which is a pretty good two-way winger to add to your lineup. They have Ely Tolvanen and Philip Tomasino. I think Tomasino is probably going to be the better player. Uh, but those guys might be able to bolster uh, the middle of that lineup a little bit. And the division is, I don't know if it's easy, but, you know, uh, the bottom of the division of, um, of Nashville Central Division looks fairly weak. They have Arizona. They have Chicago. Um, Winnipeg. Um, doesn't look that great, even though Connor Hellebuck might still be really, really good. So that is worrisome to me. But if I'm looking at the West of one of the teams that made the playoffs last year that might miss it this year, and I don't think they'll get to 97 points, I think it's Nashville. What do you think? Yeah, I'm, I'm not really on the, the Predators bandwagon here either. And one of the things was, like, there was a stretch last year where that Nashville top line was just producing, producing, producing. It was, like, insane. Like, yeah, they were – to tie in DFS again, they were coming in underpriced and underowned on almost every slate, and you just kept playing them and you kept winning. But then their numbers started falling off, and then they started losing and losing. <laughs> and their saving grace was like Ryan Johansson just couldn't stop scoring. It was one of the most ridiculous things I've ever seen. Like, there's no way Ryan Johansson repeats that performance. If I had hair in my head, I'd say if he does it, I'd shave my head, but I have no hair in my head. So... <laughs> I don't know. Like, I love Matty, uh, Phil Forsberg as a player. I was kind of shocked to see him re-sign. But, um, you know, I'm also a big Soros guy. But outside of Forsberg, Soros, and Yossi, it's kind of, I don't know. Like, you take one of those guys off the team, there would be no debate whether they're a playoff team or not. Those three guys have to have career years again just to sniff the playoffs. Yeah, I, I think that's what worries me is, is you're relying on a lot repeating, like just one key injury uh, for like 30 games or something could sink the whole thing. Um, so I'm definitely not in on Nashville. Uh, you have uh, probably my favorite listing on this entire uh, betting pod. You have the Mitch Marner goals total. I do believe it's 29 and a half. I don't think I have to ask on which side of that you're on. Uh I'm pretty sure where you're going with this, but uh, why don't you talk to us about your minor goal bet? I, I don't know if you do, because <laughs> I'm going over. Oh, really? I'm going over. That was not what I expected yeah. to hear. I can't wait to hear so, this. Beginning of the year, me, me and Mitch got off on the wrong foot. We were having our issues. And I was like, you know what, Mitch? Just shoot the puck. Just shoot the puck, Mitch. And what happened? He started scoring goals. Now, last year... He scored a career high 35 goals. It was also his highest shooting percentage of his career, over 15%. His career average before that was in the 11s. Uh, that being said, he did have career highs in shots per 60 minutes and individual expected goals. He's playing the majority of his minutes with Austin Matthews. He's on the top power play, you know, unless the coach, you know, decides to go galaxy brain and put it with Tavares again. That was just a meme. But if he continues to shoot the puck, continues uh, around the shots per 60 he had last year, I think he goes over 29 and a half. And you're getting minus 115. Even if he has, you know, five less goals than he did last year, you're still cashing that bet. Um, I want to hate on Mitch Marner, but after he started shooting towards the second half of the year, he turned into one of my favorite players and plays for DFS. Yeah. And, you know, like you said, playing all your minutes with Matthews, that line with Michael Bunting was probably the best line in hockey. Um, you know, he's going to play 20 to 21 minutes a night. You know, he's going to get a lot of ice time. Um, I think he's, he only played 72 games last year too. Right. So if he can get, you know, 78, 79 games, that gives him a little bit more of a cushion as well. I was honestly waiting for you to just bring the hammer down on Mitch Marner in the Leafs. Uh, I, keep I thought you were, were going to get real spicy real fast, but maybe you're saving those takes uh, for the regular season. Um, all right, let's get to my next one. I got another team point total here. 
I got the Anaheim Ducks, depending where you're going, anywhere from 78 and a half to 80 and a half. I'm taking the over on their points. They had 76 points last year uh, in a season that saw Trevor Zegras kind of cement himself as one of the game's top young stars. Um, Troy Terry absolutely uh, destroyed the league, 37 goals, I think. Um, I know some people are worried about uh, Troy Terry specifically repeating that performance. Like I'm not, I don't know if he's going to score exactly 37 goals or whatever, but he had a lot of very, very strong micro stats for a couple of years heading into last season. He was kind of like Jesper Bratt, kind of just waiting for him to put it all together. And he certainly did that uh, last year. I mean, Anaheim added Ryan Strom and Frank for Toronto coming over from New York. Uh, they signed John Klingberg, um, you know, the guys like Zegris uh, and Terry and Jamie Drysdale are all a year older, um, a year more experienced. Uh, they got Mason McTavish coming in, who's the favorite for the Calder Trophy. Um, I don't know if anybody watched Mason McTavish last year, but he played in the NHL, the OHL, um, played uh, in the Olympics, and he, then he just played in the World Juniors this summer. And I watched him both in the Olympics uh, and the world juniors. And there are a lot of times he was far and away the best player on the ice. I think make Mason McTavish could come in, make a big difference for this team in the middle of the lineup. You know, can John Gibson return to form of a few years ago? Like it's been a few se bad seasons in a row now for Gibson. I don't think he can hang it all on the team though. Certainly the defense hasn't been good, but all you need is John Gibson returning to John Gibson. And they probably uh, clear, uh, you know, 80 points let alone the improvements uh, on the teams themselves. What do you think about Anaheim uh, this year and getting over 80 points? Yeah, I at the beginning of the offseason, I was like, man, the Pacific, not too good. But then Calgary reloaded. Seattle got better. The Kings got, which we'll get to, they got better. Edmonton still has McDavid and Dreisaitl. You know what I mean? This division is tough. That being said, they're a pretty good team as long as they stay healthy. That was like the, the thing last year. They didn't have guys to replace the depth. Now you bring in a Strom, you bring in a Vetrano, you bring the young kids up. I think they can get away with having an injury and there's another guy to step up. Now, I don't agree with them getting rid of Sonny Milano, but you know we don't have another 45 minutes to rage about that. Um, <laughs> But I think they're a pretty good young team. I, I know I bashed on Ryan Strom a lot, but like how saying he's not a legit number two center in the NHL, he's probably, you know, but he is an NHL center, which is better than what you can say for when someone took an injury and you're, you're moving, you know, Isaac Lunderstrom up to the 1C. He's more suited for the bottom six. So I think getting those depth adds definitely gives them a shot getting over 80 points and, you know, Klingberg is a very underrated ad here. He's going to help him on the power play. Um, can't hurt him compared to the blue line last year. And if Gibson gets any more help, like he just needs a little bit of help on that blue line. And I think he'll have a much better season. Yeah. Um, you're right about the improved division. That's one of the things that worries me about that total, but I think their improvements as part of that, um, you know, I'm not saying that they're going to make the playoffs, but can they finish with like 87 points or something like that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, yeah, over on Anaheim, and you and I uh, have a little bit of a combined uh, combined bet coming up. Obviously, we're not combining bets, but we're both thinking the same thing about the same team. Uh, you have the Los Angeles Kings to reach a one the 100 point plateau as a team. I have the Los Angeles Kings uh, both to win the Pacific uh, and to win the West. Um, I'm going to go through my stuff real quickly. Like they had 99 points last year, which is like, you know, what, which is why your 100 point bet really does make a lot of sense. Um, they added Kevin Fiala, who I think gives them that offensive game breaker that they were really desperately missing last year. Like they had a lot of very good players playing well as a team, but Fiala is, a, like I said, is a game breaker that can just carry a line by himself. Um, you know, uh, Arthur Kaliev, I thought, had a very good rookie season. Um, you know, shooting percentage hurt him a bit, but he was shooting a lot. Played had good defensive metrics as well. So Kaliev gives him a little bit more depth on the wing. Uh, Quinton Byfield, hopefully, he can take another step. He's a year older. I think the big thing with Los Angeles is having a healthy blue line, right? Um, 
Drew Doughty missed 43 games. Alex Edler missed 41 games. Sean Walker missed 76 games. Matt Roy missed 15 games. Um, Ali Mata um, went to Detroit in the offseason, but, you know, they have Brant Clark, one of the top defense prospects in the league coming up. Like, I think this, as long as the blue line stays healthy, they should be pretty good. I don't know. I, like, I see the Kings as, you know, they're, they're being priced fairly, I think. Um, but I could see them. I could honestly see them winning that division this year. So give me your thoughts on the Kings reaching 100 points. Yeah. So Fiala is a big upgrade for them. It depends where they play him. But if he's on that second line with Philip Deneau and Victor Arvidsson, there's some mighty fine second lines in that division. The Calgary Flames have one. You know, I guess like the Oilers have one. Not very good defensively, but like. The Kings and the, the Flames have probably the two best second lines in the NHL if, if you know, Fiala is there. And here's the thing. Here's the one thing that worries me. They need to hand over the, the reins to Cal Peterson. For whatever reason, they keep running John Quick out there. Yeah, Peterson didn't have a, a great season last year, but they never gave him a chance to have one. He would play one game, have a bad game. Quick would play two or three games. Peterson would play, you know, one game have a good game, and then they go right back to quick. Let Cal Peterson take the reins. He's a better goalie at this point. Even if you don't know that, you got to, you know, at least give him the shot because quick is, you know, his, his career is basically on the way out. So give it to Peterson. I really like this team. Now, here's another reason why you shop for these lines. LA Kings 100 plus points is plus 170 on DK. Their points over under on DraftKings is 95 and a half at minus 115. To basically, you're going to get almost a dollar per bet more if you think they're going to win two more games. So, why not do that? And it's the same. And I, I made this note about the Rangers. The Rangers over under total is set at 99 and a half at minus 120. If you go over to the tab 100 point season, the Rangers 100 point season is minus 110. You're getting a free 10 cents there. So that's another reason why odd shop are so important. Shop for your best lines. You're saving yourself 10 cents per dollar. Do the shopping. But yeah, King's 100 point season. As long as, you know, they stay healthy again or their defense stays healthy, you see Kaliev move up in the lineup. But maybe with Byfield, like you get some shelter third line minutes. I think, you know, a team's going to be tough to beat. Yeah, I agree. I, I, like, I'm really excited to watch them this year, which feels like it's been a long time since we've been able to say we're excited to watch Los Angeles Kings. Even when they were, you know, verging on their quasi dynasty a decade ago, they were kind of tough to watch sometimes. But I do think they're going to be a pretty fun team. Yeah, 2014, not fun to watch. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's get to another one of your uh, team points totals, the Detroit points total. Um, depends where you're looking, uh, for your point totals. Uh, I had that, uh, written down here, um, anywhere from 80, 84 and a half, uh, 83 and a half depends where you look, so probably 84 and a half in most spots. I don't know which side you're on, uh, but Detroit made a lot of pretty big additions in the off season and look ready to kind of start taking those steps back towards the playoffs. Talk me into the, into the Detroit Red Wings. What are you taking here? So I'm on the over here. Um, if you can find 83 and a half. Great. 84 and a half. I'm still on the over. They scored 74 points last season somehow with that <laughs> roster. Yeah. I was pretty surprised when yeah. I saw that. Yeah, yeah. 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 They have a new coach. It's the Tampa Bay assistant coach from last year. Stevie Y, you know, that's the Stevie Y guy. Um, they added Andrew Kopp. They added David Perron. They added Dominique Kubalik. They added Ben Sherratt. They added Oli Mata. That, the cop Perron Kubalik shirt up their middle six. They had that one line. I don't know what the Canada COVID rules are, but if they get relaxed a little bit, you're going to have Tyler Bertuzzi for 82 games, assuming he stays healthy. Um, you're, you only need five more wins out of them. And they're adding all these players, replacing replacement players really in the middle of their lineup. You know, Ben Sherratt, not great uh, anywhere, but he's better than Danny DeKaiser ever was. And Danny DeKaiser was their number one defenseman. Oli Mata, not great, but he's a decent defensive defenseman. Something that something they've lacked. 
they have good young goaltending. They have Dylan Larkin. They have, you know, Lucas Raymond a year older in his second season. So I think I was shocked because I was looking it up. I was like, over 84 and a half. That's crazy. But then you see 74 points. I was expecting their points total to be like 58 last year. I, you don't think of them as a great team, but they get a coaching upgrade. They shored up their middle six. They shored up their blue line. I think over 83 and a half, 84 and a half is a good bet here. Yeah, and especially if that goaltending turned around, right? It was Alex Nedeljkovic's first season in Detroit last year. Obviously, it wasn't a very good season. They brought in Vili Huso. I still believe that Nedeljkovic can be a good goalie, but at least now they have – um, a little bit of security in net. Surely one of those guys is going to have a good season. So I do like your bet over 84 and a half. All right. I got a few props and trophies coming up. My first one, you're going to love it. Uh, Chris Kreider. Uh, I think the best one is over on DraftKings at, at time of recording under 41 and a half priced at minus 115. Obviously, he cracked the 50 goal mark last year. It was uh, a massive career year for him couple notes on this, though. Um, he had never been above 2.6 shots per game, got up to 3.2 last year, um, shot over 20%. Now, I know we shot 19%, I think, in the uh, bubble season, in 2021 season. But, like, repeating 19 20% year after year is tough. So just a little bit of pullback in volume, you know, a little bit of pullback in shooting efficiency. And <laughs> I know that they have a lot of high-end pieces on the power play, but over the last three years, the new the with Kreider and uh, with Kreider on the ice on the power play without Ryan Strom, the team scores about four fewer goals per sixty minutes. That's a lot. Now I figure that you know somebody like Hedl or Lafreniere or you know you know maybe it's probably just Trocheck can fill that void. But when you have such a great power play, sometimes changing out one piece can really kind of screw things up. And like I don't, my personal projections have Kreider for. Um, a bit over 38 goals, which is why I would, you know, I wouldn't take under 38 and a half, which I think is what it is on FanDuel, but 41 and a half on DraftKings, I'm fine with that. What do you think about me trashing your boy? Well, here's the thing. He's a big power forward. He's on the wrong side of 30. And every tipped shot he had last year went in the net. It was like every time he tipped the puck, it was a goal. He had one of those seasons just like everything – it's kind of like he's having an Aaron Judge season. Everything he touches goes in the net. Yeah, um, yeah. It, it, kind of like Matt Duchesne over, had over yeah. in Nashville too, right? So, like, yeah, he still can have a great season and not score 56 goals or whatever it was. You know what I mean? He can make a positive impact. You know, he's going to have those power play goals because he's, you know, the net front and he's a big boy. But, you know, I think that was the first time he was even over 40 goals in his career, let alone 50. So, like – yeah, maybe that's an outlier. He's not any younger. They have more talent now. They don't have to rely on him as much. So, you know, Rangers have one of the best power plays in the league last year. Maybe it regresses a little bit. Maybe it gets better. But, like, maybe Panarin starts shooting more. If Panarin starts shooting more and he has more goals, there's less goals for Kreider. So, yeah, I, I'm on the under here, too. I still think he has a good season. But don't expect 50 goals out of him again. Yeah, it, it is a lot to ask of almost anybody not named basically like Austin Matthews. Like even just expecting Leon Dreisel to crack 50 no matter what, I feel like is a lot to ask. Um, you have – like I'm going to get let you take this away. There's one spot uh, for Nathan McKinnon to win the Rocket Richard Trophy, which is the most goals in the NHL. Um, it, it almost seems like a mispricing. I'll let you talk about it. It has to be a mispricing. Um, I went in there looking for – um, Alex DeBrincat to win the Rocket. Because I was like, you know what? He's going to have some long odds, but he's in a really good spot. I was hoping to get him around 60 to 1. Alex DeBrincat, 25 to 1. Nathan McKinnon, 45 to 1 to win the Rocket Richard here. Now, is, should he be the odds out favorite? No. But should he be 45 to 1? Absolutely not. So this is another scenario where you easily can get some, you know, value on your money without having this bet go the full season. Now, I guess, assuming it's not a misprice, I guess the books are assuming that he's going to get hurt like he always does and miss a few weeks. But say he stays healthy the first few months of the season. He just got that big old new contract, very well deserved. He was one of the most underpriced players in the league. He comes out, he starts, you know, he's leading the league around Thanksgiving and goals. 
his odds are going to jump from 45 to one to like five to one. You're going to get, you know, if you bet like a hundred bucks, I, I would assume you're going to get a four figure cash out option. Now, if you think he's going to continue that pace, which is certainly possible, you do it. Um, otherwise you can catch out, reallocate your, your, you know, money there. But 45 to one's ridiculous. Austin Matthews is the odds on favorite at plus 260. Like, I was expecting McKinnon to be in like the plus 1200 range, not plus 4,500. This bet is totally off a of missed price and hope he comes out uh, scoring goals and, you know, get a cash out option or, you know, just let it ride and hope he has an excellent season coming off a Stanley cup win. Yeah. I don't have a lot to add. Um, for, like you said, 45 to one over on DraftKings. He's actually only 10 to one on FanDuel, which is like you said, plus 1200. It's pretty close, right? That would feel a lot closer uh, than 45 to one. No problem uh, betting Nathan McKinnon um, at that price. All right. I'm going to talk about a guy I think could win the Calder Trophy this year. I Or not the Calder, sorry. The Norris Trophy as the t- league's top defenseman. Miro Haskinen from Dallas. Again, uh, you should probably shop around because you can get 25 to 1 over on points bet. It's under 20 to 1 uh, on sports interaction. So, again, um, definitely shopping makes a difference here. Um Here's the thing. Haskinen has been just below elite by uh, his defensive impacts over the last few years. Um, And he's still just 23 years old, I believe. Um, He has two top 12 Norris finishes in the voting. Like top 12 isn't significant. But again, he did that by the time he turned 22 years old. Um, John Klingberg gone. So Haskinen expected to... Um, take over the top power play unit. And that's been a big problem for him, you know, DFS, fantasy, whatever you want to do, um, is that he didn't really produce a lot of points because John Klingberg was running the power play. I think Haskinen might struggle to run the power play, but if he doesn't, like if he comes in and clicks right away uh, with Rope Hints and Jason Robertson and those guys, you know, he could have a 55, 60 point season and be elite defensively. And judging by his top 12 Norris finishes, and the way some media members talk about him, they think, you know, that's another thing with these awards is the Norris Award is voted on by the media. And it seems like a lot of the media already think he's a super high end defenseman. If he starts putting up those points, I like uh, Haskinen for the Norris. What do you think about taking Haskinen anywhere where it's 21, 25 to 1? Yeah. I mean, we've talked about it all last year in our, you know, daily strategy shows. You know, Haskinen is generally a better hockey player than the DFS player. Um, but if the Dallas stars are going to do anything, he's going to have a great year. So, um, he's definitely one of the guys outside of, you know, the, the headmans, the Yossi's, the Ekla, like the guys that you assume are going to win like Fox, that, and this and that. Usually it's a group of a few guys, but you do always want to take a shot on one of these longer eyes, longer odds guys. And he's one of the best defensemen in the NHL depending on which metrics you look at. So 20 to one there, I'm, I'm definitely taking a step. Yeah. Um, especially if they can really get that power play rolling, if he can really put up those points. Um, I do like Haskin and obviously, you know, I'd expect somebody like Kale McCarr or Victor Hedman to take it again if they, if they play full seasons, but if I can get it, Haskin in 25 to one on the off chance that power play really turns around, uh, I am taking it. Let's stick with the doors for a second. You've got another Norris candidate here. Uh, you have Aaron Ekblad from the Florida Panthers uh, to win the Norris Trophy as the league's top defenseman. Talk me into Aaron Ekblad. So a few seasons ago, I think it was the bubble season. It's hard to keep track of the past few years. He was the odds-on favorite to win until he broke his ankle or whatever. That was, that was last year, last was season. It? Yeah. And then uh, Fox ended up winning. It was the year Fox won, so two seasons ago. Well, it happened last year, too. He had like 57 I, points in 61 games or something, and then – It's hard to keep track of him getting hurt. He gets hurt all the time, apparently. Yeah, but two seasons ago, the year Adam Fox won, he was having an incredible season. You know, Panthers really didn't talk about um, too much. They kind of downgraded a little bit here. But if they're going to, you know, make the playoffs, that's not Ekblad's going to have a big year. He's involved on the power play. Um, What's his face? His skating partner. He went to Calgary. Mackenzie Wegar. Mackenzie Wegar went to Calgary. You know, there's going to, he's going to play massive minutes, 25, 26 a night. Uh, he's on the top power play. If they're going to still have a 100 point season, make the playoffs, that's not, 
uh, Ekblad's going to be heavily involved. Yeah, I, I do like Ekblad. I'd say the one thing that worries me, it's not even losing Wegar. I think that might hurt Ekblad. I honestly think it might be Jonathan Huberto uh, for that power play. Like, you know, Huberto's not very good defensively, but he's, you know, arguably the best uh, playmaking forward in the NHL, certainly probably in like the top five. Once you get past, like, you know, maybe McDavid or, or Kaprizov or what have you, um, that would be my only concern. But, you know, if Ekblad can kind of replay his seasons from the last couple of years and actually stay healthy for 80 games, yeah, I really do like it uh, quite a bit. So, Aaron Ekblad, Miro Haskinen, we have in as Norris contenders. Josh, we are running a little long. So, I'm going to finish off with a couple goaltenders here. Uh, I have two different bets. I have Ilya Sorokin to win the Vesna. You can get him anywhere from plus 750 to plus 829 over on Sports Interaction. And then I have Igor Shosturkin to win the Hart Trophy as the league MVP, anywhere from 20 to 1 to 25 to 1. The only reason I don't have Sorokin for the Hart as well um, is that he's just not offered in a lot of places. Um, here's my reasoning is I think, I think Shosturkin and Sorokin are 1-2 top goaltenders in the NHL. Like people want to argue Vasilevsky or Saros or something and that I'm not going to say no, but Ilya Sorokin has been second in basically all the sub metric categories, goal saved above expected per 60 minutes, high day, high danger save percentage, all that stuff over the last two years behind uh, Igor Shosturkin. If Shosturkin is anything, you know, but the elite super elite guy, uh, he should have won the Hart Trophy last year, by the way. But if Sisterkin's anything but the super elite guy, or maybe he gets hurt for like six weeks or something like that, I think Sorokin is the guy that would could waltz into the Vesna. And again, Sisterkin for the Hart. Goalies don't win it that very, that often, but they have won it four times in the last twenty five years. Um, Carey Price, uh, Jose Theodore, and Dominic Hasek won it twice. So you know. You're looking at once every six or seven years. Uh, Carey Price won it, I think, back in 2014. So it's been a while since a goalie won it. If Shosturkin replays the season that he has last year in this new, now that we're kind of acclimated to this new higher scoring environment, we're used to seeing guys with 40 goals or 100 points or whatever. Um, I think Shosturkin as kind of a long shot for the hard trophy is the way to go. So Sorokin for the Vesna as the league's top goalie. Shosturkin for the heart as the MVP. What do you think about those? Yeah, I mean, I I don't know if – well, yeah, I, I, I was on the Shesterkin to win the heart last year. If you just put any other goalie in the league on the Rangers last year, I don't think they make the playoffs. Like, it would have been how, close. Yeah, that's how ridiculous Igor was. Um, yeah. If he repeats or even gets better, like, forget about it. Like, Sorokin is an excellent goalie. The problem is he's not on a great team. I think, you know, you bet, like if you want Sorokin to win the Vezina, two things have to happen. Like Igor is going to have to have a subpar season and the Islanders are going to have to make the playoffs. It's rare for a goalie to win the Vezina when the team doesn't make the playoffs. It's happened. And he's it's certainly possible if he's going to have a Vezina winning season, he should carry his team to the playoffs. And, you know, they're pretty even money to make the playoffs. And I think, you know, if he does have that, that's in a winning season, they will make the playoffs. So really the bigger thing is you need Igor to take a, a step back a little bit here. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, don't get me wrong. If a goalie wins the heart this year, I expect it to be Igor. That's why I bet it. If a goalie win, you know, well, goalie's going to win the Vesna. But if Igor re replaces performance from last year, he's going to win the Vesna again. It's just I think Sorokin's the number two behind him. And if anything goes wrong uh, with Igor's season, I think Sorokin can step in, especially where he's now the lock number one goalie and he's not really splitting starts with Semyon Varlamov anymore. All right, Josh, uh, we did it. We got through a bunch of uh, preseason bets that we like. Um, any final thoughts to add um, as we start gearing up for the 22-23 fantasy hockey season? I'm excited for it. Um, hopefully uh, the games don't get canceled because, you know, last year when that happened, it was a nice little break in the middle of the season. But then towards the end of the season, we were, you know, doing six shows a week with our hair on fire. You know, we got kind of a little bit tired there towards the end. It got a little bit goofy, uh, which is fine. But, you know, I'm excited for, well, the NHL scheduling is atrocious no matter what's going on in the world. But, you know, 
we'll be able to, you know, have four shows, you know, a week. Like we're we're probably looking at shows on slates where games are four or five or more. So based on the NHL scheduling, it's always like 13, 1, 12, 2, 97, 0. You know what I mean? So like it's gonna be more paced. We'll we'll be, you know, well rested. And uh it's it should be fun. I, I'm really looking forward to NHL DFS despite uh you know what's going on in Ontario, which is sad, which may affect the market, but um, I'm excited. I don't play much DFS outside of NHL anymore. I, you know, have transitioned to other things, but I still love NHL DFS. I, I honestly can't wait. Like I can't believe the season's a couple weeks away. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm excited just to have a normal season, right? Like we, we had that break at Christmas last year, the bubble season, the year before that, where, you know, you'd have cancellations every other day and St. Louis and Arizona ended up playing each other seven games in a row or something like that. Yeah. Coyotes yeah. like 28 <laughs> days in a row. <laughs> yeah, so, um, not, I'm not uh, looking back fondly on those memories. I'm looking ahead to what should be a very, very fun and entertaining 2022, 23 uh, NHL season. Thank you so much everybody uh, for sticking with us. We, like I said, at the top of the show, we have a lot more VODs uh, and pods coming up. We're going to be talking about how to bet NHL during the season. We're going to be talking about how to play NHL DFS. We're going to talk about how to use an optimizer. We have a few more shows coming up over the next few weeks. So be sure to check back uh, every once in a while. Uh, we're going to try to post these uh, on Wednesdays. So check back Tuesdays or Wednesdays uh, to see what we have up. Don't forget to check out Odd Shopper, uh, oddshopper.com. Shop your odds for anybody that's interested in betting and click through the link below uh, if you want to become an Odd Shopper premium insider as well. Uh, all right, we are out of here for Joshua Harris, our single entry DFS assassin. I'm Michael Slim Clifford, Slim Cliffy Clifford. I'll get that right eventually. <laughs> saying good luck on your season long bets and we'll see you soon. <laughs>